the Accommodation Show. I am so pleased to be welcomed today by Peter Syme. Peter Syme is from Disrupt Travel. He's an absolute legend in the travel space. He knows an awful lot and we're going to cover some amazing topics. Welcome to the show. Uh, good morning or good evening from my side, but good morning with you around bar and thanks very much for the invite to speak to your guests on your show. Yeah, I'm really looking forward to it because we had a bit of an introduction call and you raised some topics that were very important, which uh, I think everyone will benefit from. And you have a wealth of experience in the industry. So um, maybe a good way to start off is if you could introduce yourself, let everybody know uh, who you are, where you're from and a bit about your experience. Sure, will do. Uh, my name's Pete Sign, folks. Uh, probably from the accent you can gather, I'm Scottish. Uh, I'm in Scotland at the moment, not normally here, but obviously for the last two years with the pandemic, I've been stuck here a lot. I'm um, a bit of a travel addict. I've been to 132 countries now, a bit more than that, I think, now. Uh, I've run multiple travel businesses, mainly in the tours and activity spaces, uh, inbound operators, Scotland, Morocco, Spain, outbound operator, doing expeditions all over the world. In the accommodation sector, I've run hostels, both as an owner, operator and as a manager uh, in various countries around the world. So my expertise is mainly in tours and activities, but I do have a crossover into accommodation as well. For the last few years, I've been a regular speaker at conferences around the world. Uh, and through my consultancy business, I also consult to tourism operators and travel technology platforms, be them reservation systems or uh, B2C, B2B platforms. Yeah, well, so it's, it's clear to me that you either really like travel, you really like guests and hospitality, or you like the, the whole lot. What kind of uh, attracted, you, attracted you to the industry? Uh, I do like the whole travel, and I think the benefits travel brings to society as a whole are, are immense. But like everybody in travel, because the travel industry is so huge and so fragmented, everybody finds their own niche in it. And my niche was certainly the adventure side travel, so running expeditions, running inbound operators that were doing adventure products like canyoning, rafting, etc. etc. So the adventure side of travel is what is my real passion or has been for the last God knows many decades. But obviously none of that happens without the whole travel infrastructure working around it. That still means flights, that still means transport, that still means accommodation that all has to interact and work around the passion that you have in your niche in travel. And do you think uh, that the industry has sort of, everything's kind of coming together a bit more? So in the past, it was where, where it was fragmented, but now we're actually seeing a convergence of sort of everyone working together, or if you're in one segment, you have to sort of look after all the different segments? In the past, I was, the super fragmentation in the past kept it fragmented. The, the crossover and working together in a slick way didn't happen. In a, it always happened in an offline way, in a non-digital way, because people had to catch a taxi from the airport, they had to get into a hotel, they had to go to a restaurant, they had to do the activities, the tours and stuff. So it was always happening in a connected way from a customer's point of view, but not a connected way from the industry's point of view. And for the customer to have them experiences, they might have had to have five conversations, ten different conversations with different people, or in today's world, use five different apps, six different apps to make it all happen. So pre-2019, still super fragmented. Pandemic has given a lot of people a lot of time to dig deep, look at how the industry structured, look at how we can do it better. So coming out of the pandemic, I see the first signs of hope, should we say, that the different sectors are really interested working with each other now to create better customer, because this is all about the customer experience. If you create a better customer experience for the front end, through time, the back end, all the operators in the ecosystem will, will benefit from that. But to create the better customer experience, particularly in today's world, you've got to be working together in a connected way on platforms and using apps and using mobile technology. There is no other way of doing it, because that's what the customers of today expect. So do you think the pandemic is what has driven this? So the customers are changing their demands in terms of what they're actually yes, looking the, for? The pandemic has basically acted as a great accelerator. So everything that was happening anyway, what people were talking about, but was probably in schedules for five to 10 years, has been squeezed and happened in a matter of months, or certainly in a matter of a year, 18 months. So technology advancement has gone rapidly because people 
have time to focus on one thing or were focused on one thing to get it to get it to get it the solutions and the customer demands uh, coming into the industry and you've got to remember the industry now has x million less staff human beings than it did before the pandemic and they're not all there to be recruited back in many of them have left gone to different industries and won't come back so the industry hasn't got a choice in this we have to become more digital focused to serve the guests because we haven't got the people to serve them in the way that we served them before the people have gone and they're not coming back in any huge numbers yeah and look i think that's a, a conversation that i was actually having uh, yesterday with an operator uh, about the digitization of the business and one thing that i've actually found is a lot of business owners have either just kind of dug their heels in decided that they're going to keep them going and then there's other ones that are saying hey you know what this is it this is the point where i'm kind of going to stop doing this because the margins aren't so good it's really hard work and one thing that is very obvious is that because of technology or due to technology the amount of work that you put in has changed or can be different so therefore if you want to keep them going you don't want to work as hard all you have to do is you have to sort of keep up pace uh, introduce automation into your business uh, and digitize the business uh, in terms of uh, tools and activities in terms of the digitize, digitization of the business are there active changes that are happening that you can see that businesses are leveraging yes i mean it's been slow it's speeding up now because of the pandemic but pre-2010 virtually no one was on any sort of connected technology some people had built their own technology some people had used the guy around the corner to build them some sort of reservation system linked to the website now about 20 to early 20 percent of the industry are all on reservation platforms SaaS in the cloud which gives them connections to multiple distribution and connect to all the OTAs can connect to other distributors as well so there's about 20 percent of the industry who are treating digitalization quite serious at the moment and that that's picking up pace uh, as as we happen at the moment and it, it's a kind of split industry in that there's over a million operators around the world on tours and activities 50 percent of them have started in the last five years mm. so the 50 percent who have started in the last five years are much more open much more wanting to start from a technology point first whereas us oldies who have been doing it for decades a lot of us take longer to get dragged into it because we had processes we had ways of doing things we have established businesses and then it's always harder changing an established business than it is changing a brand new business and if you're dealing with 100 customers a year and you're just starting up it's easier to flip that and change it and do something different from a business that's dealing with 50,000 customer years and they're stuck in their ways because of habit and because it has worked in the past and just because it worked in the past it's easy to believe it's going to work in the future unfortunately we're living in a period now where that's not the case things change and things change rapidly so i guess you've uh, you've kind of left a bit of a problem for a lot of people so you've got the 50 percent that are coming in that are all i guess a bit more tech savvy and then effectively what you're saying is the other 50 percent or whatever the percentages are doesn't really matter need to do something and they need to make some changes and look that's the same in, in accommodation um the lucky thing is that uh, the listeners to this show generally, I'd say, are, are a little bit more advanced and tech savvy because they're spending the time to learn from people like you and me. There are people that might not be there just yet and just think, no, no, it's still okay, it's still okay. What would what would be your number one tip in terms of the next step? So, so you, yeah, someone's listening to us and like, oh, you know what? I should probably uh, do something about about uh, doing an overview of the business and where I'm I'm at digitally what would you recommend they do in terms yeah, of that next step the number one thing i was trying to get operators to think about is demographics who is your customer and who is your customer today and who is your customer going to be tomorrow and do research on them customers to make sure they match your product and how that customer is interacting on a digital journey as well as a journey and destination you have two journeys with a customer a digital journey pre-arrival a journey in destination that is a mix of digital and real touching feeling experiencing real things and you really have to map these journeys that doesn't take technology that takes an understanding of who your customers are it may take a bit of research and it may take a bit of surveying maybe take a bit of uh, speaking to a lot of guests in depth 
but you really have to map out your customer journey pre-arrival and arrival and then when it and when they're in the destination and then you're looking for better ways to serve them at all points ways that serve the customer better and ways and ways that increase the efficiency of your business there's always a there's always a balance between efficiency and effectiveness and one of the weaknesses of the new operators i see coming in is they go for efficiency over effectiveness so they believe everything has to be digitalized to every to every level and it's not always the case mm. and everything in this is a mix and a balance and you're looking for what is the most effective way to serve the guests and the most effective way to serve your business and certainly in my experience it's always been a mixture of digital and a mixture of real live hands-on experiences with the guest serving the guest humanly because we're all human beings and we all travel to experience human things so it is a real mix here of what's and one thing it suits one business doesn't necessarily suit another business but in the small to medium sized accommodation sector i always try to get people particularly in small hotels uh, up to 30 40 50 maybe up to 100 rooms to look at the hostel sector and they're like why do i want to look at the hostel sector they're way below me in the value chain and i and I'm doing this, and I may not be a big hotel chain, but I've been doing this for a long time. And I'm going, yeah, but the hostel sector has been selling ancillary products to their customers for years. Maybe not in a digital format, but because they were only earning 15 bucks, 20 bucks for the bed, they had to sell the customer other services and deliver other services. Otherwise, the economic model of the hostels didn't work. Whereas someone who's selling a hotel room for 120 bucks, 150 bucks, 200 bucks, when times were good and the fill rates were 98%, they didn't really care about selling other stuff. And the world we're in at the moment, with many city centres around the world still having occupancy levels below 50%, now you have to look after the customers you do have really, really well and maximise the value out of these customers. Really, because there's a lot of back value that accommodation can give a customer over and above the accommodation because you are the one person in destination that is probably guaranteed to have human contact with the customer. There's lots of other things in the customer journey and a visit of a travel experience that the customer may only have digital input into, that the hotel normally guarantees human contact. And that is a huge opportunity that in my experience, hotels just don't maximize at all. Don't even start to scrape the beginnings of the opportunity there. Yeah, look, I've I found exactly the same thing, and it doesn't really matter if you're if you've got a, a one bedroom or you know a, a Airbnb property all the way through to a, a motel or a hotel. Uh, the same rules apply, and you can sell these ancillary services um, to the customers. And what I'm kind of hearing you say between the lines, though, is that. Uh, I've had this debate and about about ancillary services, and it's kind of this upsell type thing. And a lot of operators loathe the idea to have to sell uh, and to have to do that sort of thing. Um, I see it from a different perspective, but I would love to hear your thoughts about about that particular point before I kind of give my mine. Yeah, the, the first thing is, and I've done it in my own businesses for decades, so I, I specialize in spoken they may think they're buying from my, one of my venture companies they may think they're buying a rafting trip but by the time the contract's signed or the time the, the delivery is done they've bought some transport they've bought some accommodation they've bought some food or a whiskey distillery tour or something so we, and it's much much easier before someone pays like a huge and the data's out there if before someone pays you can add in a lot easier than after someone's paid and that's psychology because after you've paid that's the price. It fixes in your brain. I bought that room and it cost me $90. Someone comes back and tries to spin something on that or add something on it. You view it as an extra cost. Pre-purchase, you view it as added value. And that's distinctly different. And it's much easier to upsell, cross-sell and bundle pre-transaction rather than post-transactions. What does that mean for uh, operators of small accommodation? Well, obviously, if they're getting the bookings direct, they're in a position to do that. If they're getting the bookings through third parties or through OTAs, they're not really in a position to do that. So that comes on the direct bookings to buy one of the value to direct bookings. 
hugely more because you get the opportunity to employ the booking if they're the customer, the customer, the customer better. But I have also experienced in our industries, particularly in the tourism industry, most operators are there to deliver the experience that they do, be it a walking tour, a food tour, a historic tour. They're not salespeople, they're not marketing people. So they find it really, really awkward to upsell and cross-sell. And the only way I try and communicate with them is, is it is cross-selling and it is marketing, but what you're doing is serving the guests better. And if you go back to what I said earlier, and if you've mapped a customer journey and a customer experience pre-arrival pre and in destination, there is gaps everywhere that that customer is going to spend money anyway. It's a given. They are going to spend money anyway. It's only a choice of where they're spending it. They're going to use taxi. They're going to use restaurants. They're going to go on experiences. They're going to go to museums. So it's only a choice of where they spend it. They are going to spend it. And it's whether you want to provide that service or you don't. And look, I mean, this just really sort of leans itself into some industries that have been doing it very well. Um, we spoke about this before that the airlines have been doing this for, for a long time and understood this very well. And yeah. I know for a fact that they've got massive departments that work on this particular problem um, of making sure that that bark, that the spend or the basket is with them, ra it goes through them so that they can take a clip on the way through. Um, I'd love you to talk about, about sort of airlines and that sort of thing. And then afterwards, I'd like to sort of maybe think about, well, if the airlines can do it, how can we apply the same rules to our checkout when we don't have, you know, a team of, of a thousand people that are, you know, drilling down yeah. on demographics of, of their users and, and looking at destinations and that sort of thing. For sure. Now, now one of the things you've got in, in the, the rough numbers in the airline industry is you take the global airline industry, it's about 52, 54% of their revenue comes from auxiliaries. So their actual core product is less revenue than the auxiliaries, which seems bizarre. It seems madness. But that's because their core product has become a commodity. And it's a price-driven commodity and the price has been pushed down. So and the return on capital in airlines, when you have to spend billions buying planes, it was all out of kilter. So they had, they were forced into an environment, God, this doesn't work. This industry is not working anymore. Where do we make the value back? And they went in and out series and found us some success and built it up, made it great. Now, if we look at the hotel industry, the hotel industry at the moment in global data is running about 12% on auxiliaries. Now, one of the reasons for that is pre-2019, the hotel industry's globally was doing pretty well. Huh? And operators that weren't doing well would be a combination of not being a good operators or being in a really poor location. But overall, the industry was doing pretty well. Uh, the bed fill rate was high, and it was about maximising the price per bed rather than introducing any other services to it. So you have to you have to look at the overall environment why you've got a miss a mismatch in it. But as we mentioned earlier, we're now in a period where fill rates and beds across the world aren't as high and none of us really know when it's going to recover fully. Therefore, it's up to operators of accommodation to look uh, where they can upsell and cross-sell. And I would actually argue in some ways it's easier than, than a, an airline has to do it because they're doing it at such scale and you say they've got the resources to do it at scale and it has to be digital for them. They have to do it digital. They have no choice. Right, so it either works digital or it doesn't. And you've got to mind the, the conversion rate digitally is still pretty small, but they have the massive number to look at it. Where an operator has an advantage is if you've got a 30 bed hotel, you've got the operator, you've got the chance of doing it digitally if you invest in technology, but you've also got the chance of doing it by human. Because you're still speaking to a lot of bookings, pre booking, particularly if it's a group booking or some special booking where they phone you and ask you questions. I still phone hotels today. Right? Although I've been working in the digital space for decades, I will still phone a hotel because often I'm on an OTA, I look at the hotel I want, and I phone the hotel to give them the direct booking because I know it's more value for them. So I'm still communicating with the hotel. And I have sat, I was sitting in the hotel room, hotel lobby the other day, and the phone didn't stop. So hotels have an opportunity from a, a digital framework 
to sell more product in destination, but critically they have that human input pre-booking and then again on booking. But I do come back to it, pre-booking converts much, much higher than in destination. Even though in destination, the customer still has to spend money. They're going to go to restaurants, they're going to book some accommodation. I'll give you some examples here. I, in the last two weeks. Just before you, before you give that example, I've got a question. The, you said that you quite often call hotels. How often has someone tried to upgrade you or upsell you on those phone calls? Virtually no. There has been one or two, normally by bigger scaled hotel rather than the smaller operator. And the normal conversation goes like, I've been on Booking.com or Expedia or whatever, I've seen your hotel, I want to book direct rather than book through the OTA. That's the price the, yeah. the OTA gave me. Yeah. I'm not asking for a discount because I know kind of I'm in the industry, so I'm yeah. not hunting around for the best, best price, just match the price. And I've often been told by the hotel, oh, we can't do that price. <laughs> and I'm like, but you're direct. <laughs> and and that, has, that has happened from scaled hotels to small hotels. And it still happens today. Mm -hmm. and there's just no excuse for that. That's just a lack of training of whoever's on the phone yeah. or whoever's on, on, on the desk. It's happened me, to me face to face where I've been staying in a hotel for several days, decided to extend my stay for several days, quick check of the price on one of the OTAs down to the desk, and they wouldn't match it. And I'm in the hotel. Yeah. And, and, and that is just, crazy. I don't know what way of craziness that is, but that's just on another planet of craziness. So, um, so right, okay, so we've said that they, so you're going to give some examples before I interrupted. Yeah, so these are live examples, just to, so your listeners can understand that it's not just small hotels. So I've stayed in two hotels and one Airbnb in the last two weeks. All right, the first hotel was in Porto in Portugal, it was a five-star hotel. I don't normally stay in five-star hotels, but sometimes because of work, I was in a five-star hotel. It was a locally owned five-star hotel, so it's not part of a big chain part of a wealthy businessman, small business, well, I'll say small, medium-sized business, Portuguese business in there. So it was a luxury, newly built hotel that was excellent. However, from check-in, and I booked direct. The booking was direct. It wasn't through OTAs. Check-in was fine from a service point of view of rooms, keys, all of that stuff, although it could have been digitalized lots more. If I'd spent that money building that hotel, I would have digitalized it a lot more. But there was no attempt to interfere on or help me with transport to the hotel or back. There was no questions about where they want to eat in the hotel, out the hotel, even though the hotel was situated, surrounded by some of the best restaurants in Northern Portugal. There was no interaction with, and they knew I was there for a wine conference. I was there because of wine. There was no uh, introduction to sellers around them. I was literally 200 metres from... 15, 20 port sellers. There was just no real interaction apart from just what the inside the hotel could serve me. So that hotel probably over X number of days had an opportunity of upsell of several hundred dollars and it grabbed none of them. I also stayed in an Airbnb in Portugal that week. Now, although I didn't meet anybody face to face because the host wasn't a host, it was one of the Airbnb companies, people running the little business of an Airbnb, but the digital communication was world class and the service to check in, check out was world class. Uh, the minute I got in Airbnb were tr trying to get me on tours, trying to get me on this, all done digitally. Not as effective, I would say, as meeting a nice person who's describing the, the region around you. Mm -hmm. But I would class it as they were doing the best possible job, job they could. Now, down to some of the scale of your owner's hotels, I was in a hotel there three nights ago in Seville. In Spain, three-star hotel, locally owned, mid-size. I probably had a maximum of 40 rooms in there. Again, I was in it for four nights. Absolutely zero communication trying to give me anything. When I arrived, which was at 10 o'clock in the evening, and I was the only person checking in, it took 20 minutes to check in, and I was the only person. And, that was, and they were expecting me again. It was booked direct. They had paper in front of them with my name on lists, and there was lots of shuffling of paper, scoring out this, scoring out that, me signing this, me signing that. So a lot of process and passports getting scanned and all of this stuff. 
huge amounts of process and no real communication about the destination, about where I was in the city, where the nearest food is, where any services I may want. Whereas outside, the, I knew because I'd looked at the area before I walked in, I knew there was a little takeaway co coffee shop outside. I knew where the restaurants were because that's what I do. I'm in the travel industry. But that hotel made no attempt and for four days made no attempt. So the only money it made out of me was the money it got for the room, where in reality, I ate out every night. I booked multiple taxis when I was there because I was living in the centre of the town and the conference was four miles away. So I was in and out taxis all the time. I had to get back to the airport, another taxi, meal out every night. There was no communication, nothing. Also tours, we did several tours as, as well. So they're, they're examples of good Airbnb style, top class money, five star hotel with the amount of investment that's gone in there and even they're not mastering it. And then a, a historic old hotel that's been owned by the same family for decades and they're not getting there. Now all of that is just missing opportunity because the money is going to be spent, it's just not going to be spent with you. Yeah, I think that the, the one thing that I've noticed uh, through the pandemic in the past couple of years is that consumer expectation is starting to shift and to move. It's kind of, and, and quite dramatically, it's, it's, it's a bit like uh, the, when Uber came into the taxi industry and, you know, you wanted, you expected a, a water when you got into the car at the very start. I remember those, the good old days and you got a mint. Um, and so the expectation of what a taxi ride would be started to change. Overall, you know, you wanted to know when the when the taxi is going to arrive. Your experience became so much more important, and I think that with um, accommodation and tours, it's going to be exactly the same thing. Is that the customer's expectation will change, especially with companies like Airbnb doing such an aggressive job at, at looking after customers and looking after the hosts. They, they've got one division for that. They've got the hosts for the guests, making sure that the guests. Uh, happy it's all about star ratings and, and and kind of looking after that side and creating the right experience so that uh, there's no misalignment along the way uh, so as those consumer expectations change and people want a bit more and want to be understood a bit more you're gonna have to deliver it beyond just the extra revenue I think the guests are gonna really demand it from you for you to move your business into being a lot more serving of an entire experience rather than just, you know, accommodation as it is. You've got to, you've got to, th again, demographics. Once people experience great service, it becomes a habit. And it goes back to psychology. Once you're in a habit of experiencing it a certain way, you don't ever want to go back to doing it the other way. And if you do, you then become one of these people that writes bad reviews because you've experienced it in a different way. So you know it can be done. And then if you've experienced it over a period of time, you know it can be done. Then when you see the old ways about doing it, it just hits you like a, a, a tidal wave hits you and goes, why are they still doing it like this? When the world's moved on and we're all doing it like this. So modern companies like Airbnb and digital companies are so customer focused. They are just 100% customer focused to deliver the best possible experience because they know it's sticky and they know it creates habits and they know it creates word of mouth and they know that word of mouth means the marketing's cheaper. So they're obsessive about customer service. Whereas a lot of the travel industry, we say we are and we ask for reviews all the time, but we're not really obsessive about the customer service. Because if we, if we were, we'd create the processes, create the technology, create the interactions to better serve the customer at all times. And I still come back to it. I do think traditional businesses, if they can get the technology right, have a unique advantage over digital only businesses because we get to meet the customer face to face, which mm -hmm. is the best bit about the travel experience and delivering real experiences face to face and communication is always going to be better than a digital experience if it's done correctly. But it doesn't replace the digital experience these days that the customer expects. In fact, you're probably not going to get the chance to deliver it in person unless you get your digital experience correct. The numbers of chances you're going to get are going to decline because the digital first companies will be stealing your customers away from you to deliver it in a different way.
Yeah, yeah. I, I couldn't agree more.